This is John Lenneval, and this is AP U.S. History Video 26, The Constitution Relating to Slavery. And if you like this video, don't forget to comment, like, share, and subscribe. And these videos can be found on a number of platforms besides YouTube, such as testpreparation.locals.com and lbry.com. Anyway, let's get started. Slavery splits the states. 1789, when the Constitution was ratified, there were a few slate free states and many slave states and you can see more and more free states free territories a few more slave territories but mostly you can see in 1846 as things spread freedom spread generally to more states and territories than slavery did slavery even before the constitution was ratified was a very divisive issue and it was reflected in the constitution when it was drafted as George Carlin put it, it's the old American double standard, you know, say one thing, do something different. And of course, this country is founded on the double standard. That's our history. We were founded on a very basic double standard. This country was founded by slave owners who wanted to be free. Compromise and delaying the decisions. While many noted the inherent conflict between slavery and the idea of independence and the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, Everyone in power allowed slavery to continue, mostly because they saw it as an economic necessity for especially the southern plantation states where they had these huge plantations and they needed cheap labor. So that was something that was going on. Slavery made the founding fathers very uncomfortable, as evidenced by the word slavery not being used in the Constitution. The Constitution referred to, in quotes, the peculiar institution of slavery by describing slaves as other persons in the Constitution when they had to distinguish them from non-slaves. Since there was no easy solution, there were compromises that we'll talk about in just a second, and any real solution to the problem of slavery was postponed for, geez, about another 70 years. Anyway, another 70 years or so before there would be a solution to this problem. The temporary workaround was the Three-Fifths Compromise. The drafters of the Constitution decided the House of Representatives would have a number of representatives from each state based on that state's population, so states with greater populations would have more representatives in the House of Representatives. The problem was, is what did they do about slaves? Slaves couldn't vote, so should they be counted for House of Representatives representation? Well, anybody in a non-slave state would say, well, no, I mean, if they can't vote, can't be represented, then why would they count as population for representation? I mean, that's kind of the flip side of no taxation without representation is, well, they're not so much taxed as they are something that generates income on which other people are taxed. Why would they themselves be counted as people to be represented in Congress you know, if they're non-voters? So... Anyway, the compromise they reached was the three-fifths compromise. So what they said was that, okay, every five slaves would count as three free people for representation purposes. Now, that was pretty good for states like Mississippi and South Carolina because if they had just gotten a five-fifths compromise where every slave counted as a whole person for representation, then that would have doubled the population of Mississippi and South Carolina for representation purposes in the House of Representatives. But three for every five was still pretty good for those purposes. The non-slave states figured, of course, as I just said, hey, if these people are chattel, just a fancy word for a property, then it makes no sense to count them as people. To them, it would be like letting a cow vote, so... That's why they didn't say, nah, it can't be five-fifths, and we really this whole three-fifths compromise thing seems like nonsense to us, but fine. If that's what we need to get the deal through, we'll do it. So the solution was reached. Slaves counted as three-fifths of a person for representation. Made no sense, but it solved the immediate problem and let the Constitution be passed. So we can compare this problem to prison populations today in the United States. Many people call prison the new slavery. For example, I did a Bing search about two, three days ago where just do prisoners count in census? That kind of auto-filled as I was typing it in. So yes, according to five sources, according to the census and the Huffington Post, basically 
you know, the Census Bureau counts people in their usual residence and considers an inmate's usual residence in the facility in which they are housed. So this is true whether the inmate is in prison, jail, detention center, any kind of possible uh, correctional facility where this person is not free to go. That person's official residence is there. So if you're from New York, but you are imprisoned in California, guess what? California gets to count you because you are located in prison, even though you would say, well, wait a minute, my home is New York City. I don't live in California. The only reason that I'm stuck here is because I'm in prison. So, and according to Huffington Post, the 2020 census will continue to count incarcerated people as residents of the place in which they are imprisoned instead of their homes, a decision which critics say can target prisoners and give unfair political power to the rural areas in which prisons are located. The idea, again, our hypothetical New Yorker, he might be from a solid blue district where everybody votes Democratic, and he would vote Democratic if he could. But he's in a rural area in California where everybody votes Republican. So then his representation, you know, his per <laughs> basically he will be counted as a, as a person residing in this solid red district. So everybody votes red. So then a Republican gets to represent this person, even though that's not what he would like. Or vice versa. I'm not picking on any particular political party. So, anyway, the census does count incarcerated people as residents of the district in which they live, in which they are imprisoned, not the district from which they were from before they were put in prison. So, that strikes me as very similar to the three-fifths compromise here. And, compared to prison populations today continued... I did another Bing search right after that one, which was U.S. industries that use prison labor. So companies like Walmart, AT&T, Whole Foods, and Victoria's Secret have all relied on the labor of incarcerated people, so people in prison. And right now there are people in prisons all over the country working for little to no money making hand sanitizer and face masks to fight COVID-19. This industry is not well understood. Basically, this people in prison, they make literally pennies. I mean, they make less than a dollar an hour, usually for their prison jobs. The idea is, well, you're already in prison. We're paying for your food, clothing, shelter, etc. So they get paid very little and they can be used for useful things like making hand sanitizer and face masks. Makes me wonder if they're making hand sanitizer with ethanol, you know, drinkable alcohol. They must really keep an eye on that so people don't make prison hooch, etc. But anyway, getting back to this. These people are used to make products just like slaves were used to make products. They don't get paid very much. And again, their votes are counted as for representational purposes. They are represented by whoever the people outside the prison in those districts vote. So they're represented by... Politicians they might not have chosen, but still they count as though they are people who would have voted for those people and did vote for those people. Not exactly super fair. Anyway, this means that federal prisons can give rural states with federal or for-profit private prisons. There are prisons where people can be shipped from one state to another to you know, just handle overflow from other states, etc. And they can be run for profit to help private corporations. And all those people handle prisons from other states, and that gives the rural states a boost in their electoral power. So let's say California has too many prisoners, and they send somebody to a for-profit private prison in Montana, for example. Well, fine, then this person who might have lived in Los Angeles and would have been a solid blue Democratic voter... Um, is now in Montana, where he's probably going to be represented by a deep red uh, Republican kind of uh, representative, or vice versa. If somebody who comes from Kansas or something where they would have voted red and they end up in prison in Chicago or something like that, then all of a sudden they might be represented by a Democrat when they would have much rather been represented by a Republican. Anyway, since many jobs depend on prisons, obviously prison guard jobs, and many industries use prison laborers, there's a huge incentive to pass, in quotes, tough on crime laws, such as mandatory minimum sentences and three strikes laws. So the idea is 
everybody wants to appear tough on crime. All right, three strikes. You commit three serious felonies. You go to prison for the rest of your life, Buster. Well, that's great. Um, that makes everybody feel good, except... Well, now you have this problem that we've talked about. You've got basically slave labor in the prisons. And another problem is that these people then, as they get older and sicker, then these prisons become prison nursing homes where these people have to be taken care of and at great expense to the state. So that doesn't necessarily make this very good social policy. I don't think this is good social policy at all, in my humble opinion. But I digress. Just it's worth looking at this to see how things like the three-fifths compromise still have their effects today and we're dealing with the same problem in different ways. Anyway, hope you've learned a lot about the three-fifths compromise. Hope this helps you on your AP exam. Implicit approval of slavery. So other parts of the Constitution also implicitly approved of slavery, which it should have because it was legal. So unless they were going to make it illegal, they would have to approve of slavery. So I don't mean that it should have approved of slavery and that slavery was a good thing, but if they were going to keep it on, obviously they would have to approve of it, otherwise they'd have a problem. Slavery was evil and nasty, and I hate it as far as you, know, you should be able to tell from listening to this. But anyway... For example, the delegates voted to keep the international slave trade going for 20 more years, meaning slaves from Africa and the Caribbean could come to the U.S. for one more generation. Congress ended the importation of slaves, that is, the international slave trade, in 1808, the earliest they could according to the agreement reached by the Constitutional Convention. The Constitution also provided for the return of fugitive, that is, runaway slaves. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 provided legal procedures for returning runaway slaves, and this procedure was strengthened by the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Again, while slavery wasn't named as such in the Constitution, these provisions certainly showed the framers of the Constitution were aware of slavery and willing to tolerate its existence. Again, they didn't really have a choice if they wanted these slave states to sign on. Personal liberty laws would be passed in several states as a reaction to or against the Fugitive Slave Act. Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maine, Vermont, Michigan, New Hampshire, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin all had laws prohibiting state officials from helping people to return slaves. And you can look that up under personal liberty laws at Wikipedia, which I'll have in the description, and you can see the little URL right here. So, here we have the backlash against the Fugitive Slave Act, which was done by Lois Horton of George Mason University at the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History, and I'll have a link to her video also in the description. Did you find this video useful? Please like it and subscribe to my channel if you did. Neither action costs you anything. You'll be alerted about my new videos. Why do I care? Well, it's simple. If you're watching this on YouTube, you should know that YouTube doesn't let me share any ad revenue unless I have 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 hours of view time in a year. While many people are watching these, I don't have 4,000 hours of view time, and I don't have 1,000 subscribers at this time that I'm recording it. Pretty close, but not quite there yet. If you want to see this without ads, try joining my community at https forward slash forward slash testpreparation.locals.com. And don't forget that little colon after https. Anyway, for the same reasons, you are not only welcome, but encouraged to share links to this video, put it in playlists, etc. I'm always happy to read and respond to constructive criticism or suggestions for new videos. I'd appreciate your input. <laughs> And I reserve the right to delete comments from and block those who specialize in destructive criticism. Basically, you know what I mean, trolls or things that are off topics. Spammers disturb people. I don't want to support other people's spamvertising. And if you have problems, please go have problems somewhere else. Get help. You can hire me for tutoring if you are in the San Francisco Bay Area. I can come see you in person, you know, subject to the current COVID restrictions, etc. And if you are somewhere else, I can still work with you through Zoom, etc. Thanks for watching, and I have a little bit more to say if you want to watch for another minute or so. Contact me. Facebook. You can go to facebook.com forward slash Tutoring. All one word. 
Instagram. Okay, you can go to Instagram.com forward slash John dot Linneville dot tutoring. And phone 415-623-4251. That is my cell phone number. Email. You can email me at John at JohnLinneville.com. Website is JohnLinneville.com or JohnLinevilleTutoring.com. Both take you to the same place. And there's testpreparation.locals.com. And there's lbry.tv. You can go to that and go to at John Linneball Tutoring. And you can see mirrors of all these videos. And much, much lighter on the commercials, etc. So it's worth checking that out as a nice archive of all these videos. And mailing. If you want to send me some actual postal mail, you can go to John Linneball Tutoring. 1859 Powell Street, number 109, San Francisco, California, 94133. Finally, note, this is not a substitute for your classes, text, etc. This video is based on the Barron's AP United States History Review book and any other sources listed in the video description and my general knowledge of U.S. history. While this should help you do well on the AP U.S. History exam, I can't be responsible for what your teacher thinks is important and asks you about on or in his or her own tests, homework, etc. Please, please, please read your class texts and pay attention to what your teacher says in class. All right. Have a nice day.